As I mentioned, I'm Mark Noble, Executive Vice President of ETF Strategy at Horizons ETFs. And uh, today we are here to discuss key investment themes for 2022 using thematic ETFs. You know, for the North American ETF industry, thematic ETFs were really a key story for investors as this particular product class saw exponential growth in both performance and assets in 2021. In Canada, thematic ETFs represent about $5 billion in assets under management, and the space grew about 45% in 2021. In the U.S., the growth in thematic ETFs is even more staggering. Going into thematics, uh, going into 2020, thematic ETFs have more than doubled, sorry, going from 2020 to 2021, they more than doubled from $58.6 billion in September 31st, 2020, to approximately $130 billion in AUM at the end of 2021. And those are stats from uh, Global X, which is the uh, group that we'll be talking to today. Just incredible growth. Now, while we've seen a lot of thematic strategies have a difficult start to 2022, since many of these strategies could be categorized as more growth oriented, and so therefore they're more negatively impacted by inflationary pressure, I think it's really important to stress today that it doesn't mean there aren't some very compelling long-term opportunities in certain themes. In fact, a good thematic investment strategy is not designed for today. It's designed to capture sustainable long-term macroeconomic trends, some of which may take decades to really manifest themselves. So as you'll likely see in today's webinar, there's quite a few of these trends that we'll be going through. And here to help us understand what might be the best thematic trends is Jay Jacobs, Head of Research and Strategy at Global X ETFs. So when it comes to thematic ETF investing, there's probably no firm more globally recognized for their expertise in this field than Global X ETFs. Jay in particular has become an in-demand commentator on thematic investing. Jay leads Global X's research team, which originates the firm's unique insights on the markets and ETFs, and he also guides the planning and development of the firm's strategic direction. Jay is a frequently cited expert in the financial media and is a frequent guest on major business outlets, including CNBC, Bloomberg, and Wall Street Journal. Pretty much whenever there's something really exciting happening that I find that the financial media needs to get their head around, in particular as it comes to technology, they usually find that Jay is the first guy that they give a call to. And we're really lucky at Horizon CTFs to have a direct partnership with Global X, as we both are subsidiaries of Miri Asset Global Investments. And at Horizons, we're often able to tap into the expansive expertise that Jay and his team have in order to get context for strategies that we launch here in Canada. So that's why we're really excited to have him here today, because really he's going to help us get a better sense of what are the themes we need to be watching for this upcoming year, and is now the time to look at adding them to a portfolio. So before I get to Jay, because I don't want to take any more, too much more of, of the time up here, I do have to go through a few tips and tricks uh, for attendees today. Uh, first and foremost, this webinar will be recorded. So if you miss something, not to worry, a replay will be available in the next week or so. So please just sit back, relax, enjoy. There's a lot of really cool stuff we're going to go through. And if you look at your navigation, you will see that there will be a questions bar. We urge you to use this if you have questions for Jay. Please note, though, we will hold off on answering any questions until the end of the webinar. So if we don't specifically answer your question, we will likely have a Horizons ETFs representative reach out to you directly. Uh, Jay, I uh, want to welcome you to the webinar, and thanks for being here with us here today. Mark, thanks for uh, the great introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I always like uh, listening to what you have to say in these areas, so I'm I'm really excited about today's webinar. I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pass it on to you because we've had lots of great background discussions on what to look at for 2022, but rather than me try to you know, filter what's going to be said, let's get right to you and talk about what is it in 2022 that you're looking at and maybe investors here in Canada should be considering. Absolutely. Well, I can take it from here, but thank you for that introduction and uh, welcome to everybody on the webinar today. Uh, at Global X ETFs, uh, you know, we have a, a large team of more than 100 professionals around the world, uh, more than 44 billion in assets under management, and over half of that is coming from our thematic growth suite. So we are thinking about thematic investing uh, all the time. Uh, we're thinking about existing themes, new themes, themes that might be sunsetting, what makes sense in, in a current environment, how to fit thematic investing in a portfolio, all of that analysis we're doing on a regular basis across our research team. In fact, uh, just about a month ago, um, or two months ago now, years moving by quickly, 
uh, we released uh, a 2022 thematic outlook called Charting Disruption, where we looked at all the different themes that are disrupting the global economy and created some really engaging, interesting charts. We brought in third-party experts, we developed forecasts and conducted surveys, all to understand what is happening with these key themes in the world today and, and uh, in 2022 and beyond. So uh, using that charting disruption research as a basis for today's presentation, I'll be sharing some select slides and analyses uh, that really stood out to us as some of the most powerful things happening in the world today, especially when it relates to thematic investing. And if you want to see more, it's very easy. Just go to chartingdisruption.com, where we have tons and tons of research uh, on these themes. So uh, I'll be touching on four different themes today that uh, we think are particularly primed for 2022. Uh, that includes robotics and artificial intelligence, lithium and battery technology, U.S. infrastructure, and the latest disruptive technologies. And we'll talk about what are the what's the status of these themes and what's really propelling them going forward uh, in this year and beyond. So starting off with uh, robotics and artificial intelligence, um, interestingly, this is maybe one of the oldest themes that we track. Uh, robotics has actually been around since the 1970s when you saw the rise of Japan and the growth of the automobile industry and that need to use machines to pick up and place heavy objects and, and dangerous objects uh, in places where humans were simply not capable of doing so. Now, we've obviously come a very far away from, from there, uh, and the current environment is, is, in fact, maybe one of the most uh, uh, powerful times we've seen for the advancements of robotics and artificial intelligence. First, we have aging populations. So if you look at Japan and you know they, one of the originators of the robotics industry, they're going to have about half the workforce by 2060 that they had at their peak. So the birthplace of robotics is going to become an even more robotic-dependent society going forward. That's not just happening in Japan, that's happening in China, it's happening in the United States and across Europe. People are getting older and we don't have the workforce to replace those people. Secondly, and maybe most importantly to today's environment, we have rapidly rising labor costs. So it's getting more and more expensive to hire humans, uh, whereas technology tends to get cheaper and cheaper over time. That's the chart you're seeing on this slide. Uh, if you look at the uh, wages across the United States uh, and maybe more significantly across China, you can see that wages tend to get higher. People get paid more over time, wages increase, uh, and that makes labor more expensive. But technology, specifically robotics from uh, you know over the last 15 years has gone down about 22%. So the wider that wedge gets, the cheaper robots get versus the more expensive human labor gets, the greater that opportunity cost of not using robots is going to expand. Now in 2020 and 2021, this wedge is getting even further apart with uh, with the top line rising labor costs, making uh, robots look even uh, cheaper by comparison. So there's structural reasons for robots, but there's also more near term reasons with rising labor costs that is accelerating their adoption. Also with supply chains, though, um, it, what we've seen during the pandemic with the dependence on globally integrated supply chains, uh, depending on certain countries to be able to supply a steady, uh, a st you know, steady amount of, of processed goods is no longer uh, something that we can necessarily count on going forward. So you see a lot more companies bringing manufacturing back to their home countries, whether that's Canada, the United States, Europe. But of course, labor here is more expensive than typically overseas. So it's creating even more of an impetus to use robotics going forward. So the supply chain issues, the rising labor costs, and these aging populations all point to more robotics adoption going forward. Now, what we expect going forward and where robots are going to be used is going to be a little bit different than we saw in the past. Um, you know, previously, robots were really just used in industrial capacities, uh, building cars, uh, building consumer electronics, building semiconductors, things that humans just couldn't do because it was too heavy, too dangerous, or frankly, too detail oriented for the human hand to be able to do. And if you look at those segments over the last several years, the combination of outsourcing and the combination of, uh, along with using robots has meant we've actually seen pretty significant price deflation in those areas. So cheaper input costs, cheaper labor, and cheaper uh, robotics have resulted in cheaper goods uh, when people go to purchase them. Now, conversely, areas that have not been able to be outsourced or not been able to be uh, transitioned to robotics have gotten much more expensive. Uh, medical care and education primarily are just two areas that have not been able to leverage those cost-saving measures because they're localized and because they require 
uh, you know, more nuanced uh, elements that, that humans are, are the only ones able to provide. Now that's likely to change. Uh, this is speaking more towards the advancements in robots, not just that they're getting cheaper, but they're getting more capable than ever before. So we've seen a lot of robotics and artificial intelligence focused on the healthcare and the educational spaces. They might be asking, you know, how can a robot work in education? We're not gonna have robot teachers, but we could use AI on the back end uh, to make education uh, easier and, and more cost-effective going forward. Think about uh, all the work a teacher does to plan their um, uh, to plan their classes, uh, to put together study materials, to uh, to analyze homework and test scores. All of that can start to be automated and free up more of a teacher's time to focus on what they do best, which is teaching. Similarly, in uh, in healthcare, um, you know, doctors are still going to be incredibly important in the future, but we could have security guards, we could have cleaners, uh, we could even have some rudimentary uh, nursing skills being completed by specifically designed robots uh, that can automate those tasks. As we've seen the costs of these areas get higher and higher over time, the need to automate and to reduce costs through automation uh, is getting more and more uh, powerful. So while we've seen robots in the past focused solely on the industrial side, I think we're going to start to see robots moving to these more high touch localized areas like education and healthcare going forward. Jay, I think you raise a really good point there uh, before you move on too, is that I think a lot of people view robotics as a replacement. And I think what you're highlighting here is that in many ways, it's actually more of an enhancement and that you have the ability to integrate robotics and AI processes with very high knowledge industries or, or professions, which actually creates a greater amount of output for those professionals to do more. Would that be kind of an accurate way of looking at really where you see the future? Oh, absolutely. I mean, let's let's think about our own jobs. What would we like to automate, right? I, you know, yeah. who likes sending uh, calendar invites? You know, who, <laughs> um, you know, who likes scanning through emails and trying to sort through the junk versus the real emails? So uh, there's there's opportunities everywhere for more automation. And uh, actually, what, one of the experts that we used in charting disruption, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, who's the uh, author of the Second Machine Age, has done a lot of research on art artificial intelligence. And he's found just that, that robots are not going to displace full jobs in many instances. They're going to take tasks. And if you think a job is a combination of many different tasks. So if you think about what are the tasks that you do that could be automated, those are gonna be the easiest areas for robots to start automating going forward. So uh, as I mentioned, we've done some forecasting work as well around these themes. Um, what you'll see in this uh, chart is that robotics uh, is still very much in the early adopters phase. It's still very early in how many robots are in the world and what they're being uh, designed to do. You can see there's about 126 industrial robots per 10,000 workers, so penetration of about 1.2% of robots in the world today. Uh, it could expand far, far beyond that to eventually a $355 billion market. We're expecting over the next 10 years, though, for industrial robots alone uh, to more than double to about 37 billion. That's coming a long way, and that's frankly very fast growth for an industrial slash manufacturing focused segment of the economy. Uh, but it's still very far from the total market penetration that we could see in the future. So this is a this you know when we talk about long term investing, this is a long term theme. We're going to make progress over the next 10 years. We see the catalysts that are going to move this forward in the near term with supply chain disruptions and rising labor costs but we're still just scratching the surface with the total potential market for robots going forward. A second theme I'd like to speak about today uh, is battery tech. Um, specifically, what are some of the batteries that are being developed uh, in the effort to combat climate change, uh, specifically with this move towards electrification of transportation, moving from industrial, uh, moving from internal combustion engines to, uh, to full battery electric vehicles. In many ways, this revolution is is uh, is already underway. Uh, about 10% of cars sold around the world last year were electric, and we're seeing record car sales for uh, from uh, providers like Tesla, uh, who are the leading providers of electric vehicles. We're seeing OEMs like Ford, BMW, Mercedes, uh, GM coming out with lots of new models that are battery electric as well. And frankly, over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of progress in the costs of these cars coming down. Uh, the cost of a battery has fallen by about 85 to 90% over the last 10 years. That's excellent because that makes electric vehicles much cheaper, but you still see a bit of a premium for electric vehicles over internal combustion engines. And what we're starting to see is that we've 
because we've experienced so much cost decline in batteries over the last 10 years, that that cost decline is going to start to flatten out, uh, that it's going to get harder and harder to squeeze out those cheaper costs from batteries uh, that were really easy 10 years ago when people weren't producing them at scale. Um, over the next 10 years, we think costs are only going to fall by about 25% or so um, uh, as they continue to get more efficient at battery production. So what does that mean for the electric vehicle space? Well, you know, the, uh, you know, the hopes of having a $20,000 electric vehicle with 400 mile range might be getting a little bit ahead of themselves. Um, however, there's other tricks that can be done to reduce the costs of electric vehicles. One of them is simply shifting the battery chemistry of electric vehicles. Um, this gets a little bit into the weeds, but when you see that uh, a new Mercedes or a new Tesla has 400 miles of range, that's using a very high-end battery, a nickel-rich battery like a, a, an NMC battery construction that's at the you know, super top end of battery construction. But there's actually very old battery designs like iron-based lithium-ion batteries, which still use a lot of lithium, but are not as high-end and are frankly more durable and are great for things like buses, uh, great for trucks, great for even boats that are going to get heavy, heavy usage, maybe don't need top-of-the-line uh, range, uh, but just need reliability and lower cost per mile. So I think what we're going to start to see behind the scenes is a shift in battery chemistry away from just focusing on the luxury high end of the market and focusing more towards the mass market area. Simply by doing that, you can reduce costs uh, by about 25% of batteries uh, by shifting to a different chemistry uh, that could even be safer and more reliable. The other aspect that ends up being, you know, essentially a subsidy for electric vehicles is producing more charging infrastructure. Right now, it's frankly a little bit hard to charge an electric vehicle if you go for a long road trip. There can be hundreds of miles between EV stations on the road, which means you either need to buy a more expensive car with a bigger battery, so look at the people buying 400 mile battery cars, uh, or people still need to use an internal combustion engine and, and are not ready to adopt electric vehicles yet. But that is starting to shift, and specifically within the United States, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is dedicating about seven and a half billion dollars to charging infrastructure. That will densify the number of chargers in the United States by about seven times uh, based off of our forecasts. That is huge. That is a subsidy for electric vehicles because you don't need as big of a battery. You can charge more conveniently uh, and suddenly you can see more adoption of electric vehicles, um, not just in, in cities and city surroundings that are more dense with infrastructure, uh, but in more rural areas as well. So we think this is going to be a huge boon for further um, mass market adoption of electric vehicles going forward. As far as our themes go, this is one of the themes where we think it's going to move the furthest in terms of adoption over the next 10 years, moving from what today is still very much in the early adopters phase to about $1.4 trillion of total market adoption uh, by 2030. And that's happening for several reasons. It's not just OEMs coming out with more car models, although that's happening in a very significant way. It's the regulatory environment, which is supporting more electric vehicles, whether it's with infrastructure charging or subsidies or credits. It's the battery tech that's getting stronger and, and there's more demand for. And also that there's more uh, investment in lithium mining, that upstream component that feeds into electric vehicle batteries uh, going forward. Just, just putting you on the spot here a little bit, uh, Jay, but I'm sure you have an answer. I mean, if I'm an investor in this space, the numbers that you're highlighting here in terms of growth are astounding. Um, clearly, the cost is going down for the, the auto manufacturers to a certain degree, but then you're also looking at a potential tenfold increase in need for batteries and the components that go into them. What's sort of, in your view, the best way to get exposure to this? Would you be to own the auto manufacturers or would it be to look at actually owning the upstream components? Yeah, that's a great question because there's there's several different segments to this theme. Um, you could look at the OEMs and you could look at the parts manufacturers and you can look uh, that are that are building some of the electric vehicles and um, there's going to be winners and losers in that space. So I think you need to be very thoughtful about which OEMs you want to buy. Uh, you know, to some extent, it's a zero sum game. You have people who you know, currently build internal combustion engines that are gonna start building electric vehicles. And that doesn't mean more cars are gonna be built. It's just a different type of car that's gonna be built. So if you're looking at the car manufacturing space, you need to select who are gonna be the winners uh, in the electric vehicle um, uh, wars that are gonna be fought. Um, but maybe uh, going even further upstream is a better idea because it doesn't matter who's building the car, it's that whoever's building that car 
is going to need the raw materials that go into electric vehicles like copper, like lithium, uh, like nickel uh, that are, are still hard to come by and somewhat in, uh, in shortages. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's certainly different parts of the ecosystem that one could invest in depending on, you know, what their uh, appetite is for risk or what type of sector exposure they want. Um, but all roads lead through lithium uh, is our underlying philosophy. Without lithium, we can't have this $1.4 trillion opportunity. Right. And it becomes to some degree a replacement for traditional carbon, you know, oil future uh, fuel. I guess oh, absolutely. Point. You know, you look at a portfolio today, you know, people just completely accept I'm going to have an energy exposure in my portfolio and it's going to own traditional fossil fuels. I think it makes sense for investors to to hedge that somewhat with exposure to lithium and other battery tech as we, you know, essentially reach peak oil right around now and start to see demand decline. Uh, the replacement is going to be uh, lithium going forward. So it, it makes perfect sense to think about old energy and new energy in a portfolio. Perfect. Thanks so much. That's great. All right. So uh, I want to move ahead to our third theme. We've talked about robotics. We've talked about lithium and battery tech. Uh, but another critical theme that we've had our eye on for almost five years now is infrastructure development and specifically thinking about uh, rebuilding infrastructure in the United States and abroad, as well as how infrastructure is going to be different going forward in the 21st century. Specifically, if you look at the United States, a lot of our infrastructure was built in the 1930s and the 1960s uh, during the Great Depression and then during the post-war period. That means a lot of infrastructure here uh, on, our, in, on, on our side of the border is very old. Uh, it has not gotten proper investment since it was originally built. And we've basically taken a patchwork approach to keeping it up and running and, and truly a patchwork approach of a we might even allow a bridge to fail and then simply rebuild the bridge once it's broken, rather than taking a more proactive stance on rebuilding infrastructure uh, to make sure it's efficient, to make sure it's modern, that it's climate resilient, and that it's leveraging the most effective technology in the world today. Now this theme, while it's very um, uh, top of mind in the United States, it's something that we could think about globally as well. Uh, there's clearly changing demographics, rising, you know, the, the rising population, a rising middle class, uh, a quickly growing uh, urban rural divide, which means there's more people using a smaller amount of smaller footprint of infrastructure in more dense places. And that requires a real rethinking of what type of infrastructure we have and how we can utilize it more effectively. Of course, we also have to think about climate risks as well. Uh, a hurricane in Houston from a few years ago created almost $100 billion of damage to infrastructure. So how do we not just have the right infrastructure in place, but how do we make it climate resilient uh, for a different type of environment going forward. And then finally, how do we use, utilize technology to our advantage? Um, infrastructure today is not the same as infrastructure in the 1930s. It's not just about roads anymore. It's not just about highways and trying to fit as many cars on the road as possible. We have to think about technology infrastructure as well. How do we grow uh, our networks to be able to handle the zeta bytes of information and the billions of connected devices uh, that are accessing our digital highways? So it requires a complete rethinking of infrastructure to modernize uh, and ensure that we have this uh, infrastructure backbone to our economies going forward. Now, the biggest development in the world of infrastructure uh, is the passage of the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was passed uh, just at the end of last year in, in, uh, in the United States. A $1.2 trillion package that earmarks about half of that is new infrastructure spending for the United States. Now, I think the most fascinating part of this is where is that infrastructure going to be spent? There was huge debates about how much money there'd be for infrastructure, how much would be attributed to traditional infrastructure versus digital, even climate infrastructure. Well, we finally have the numbers uh, and we got them you know, a couple months ago, but yes, a big component will be that traditional surface infrastructure, updating the roads, bridges, and highways that we still depend on. But interestingly, about a quarter of the dollars that are uh, allocated to rebuilding U.S. infrastructure is more on the digital and electric side, uh, updating the electrical grid uh, so that it can more efficiently move energy around the country, that it can handle decentralized energy production, whether that's you know solar or wind that's being added to the grid, uh, no matter you know not just from a central uh, power plant, but you know distributed across several different parts of uh, of the power system. Um, to be able to handle electric vehicle charging. If we have millions of cars plugged into outlets at the same time, do we have the robustness to power that? 
And of course, 65 billion for digital infrastructure, expanding things like uh, fiber optic networks uh, to rural areas. Uh, so you don't have a digital divide uh, between the cities uh, and more rural areas in the United States. And also ensuring that some of the latest technology like 5G uh, is available and rolled out to everyone. So I think it's fascinating to see where these dollars are going. Uh, it's going to take quite a long time for these dollars to be spent. There's a little bit of a misconception around shovel-ready projects that they were just missing the money to be uh, to be completed. The reality is there has to be studies, there has to be environmental impact analyses, we have to get the labor and source the materials, which are in short supply right now, and then uh, you know a multi-year project to actually build out that infrastructure. So we think it's going to take you know about 10 years for the vast majority of this money to be spent in the United States, but it's going to be a persistent tailwind for infrastructure in the United States going forward, this amount of money being spent across several different aspects of the economy going forward. I think one thing to highlight there too, uh, Jay, is just that the infrastructure you're talking about isn't necessarily what we would consider traditional infrastructure. I think a lot of infrastructure is focused on like utilities and um, you know real estate. Um, I think what you're highlighting here is that a lot of this infrastructure is actually infrastructure involved in the in infrastructure building, right? I think is there's there is a key differentiating factor there, is there not, in terms of segmenting where your money would go? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, uh, the, it's the concept of infrastructure has changed so much in the last 10 or 20 years that there's even a debate about what is infrastructure. I mean, there's almost right. jokes about what is infrastructure. Uh, when uh, Democrats and Republicans were arguing over the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better plan. I mean, in the original proposal of the IIJA, uh, Biden included senior care as infrastructure, uh, thinking about kind of social infrastructure as a component of this bill. Now, it got, um, you know, that got removed in the ultimate passage was there had to be a, uh, an agreement between Democrats and Republicans. But there's such a kind of quickly changing uh, thought process behind what is infrastructure, what is providing that backbone to the economy going forward. Uh, and I think it's a really fascinating time. And, you know, this definition of infrastructure that you see in the IIJA is already reflecting that expanded definition, that it's not just roads. It's water, it's digital infrastructure, it's the electric grid, it's the environment. Uh, and I think that trend of that expanded definition of infrastructure, we're still very early in. Thank you. Great. All right. And then the fourth theme. Oh, wait, no, we have one more slide here. <laughs> Not to get ahead of ourselves. Um, using infrastructure in a smarter way. Um, so this is leveraging not just, you know, recognizing that technology is a part of infrastructure, but using technology to be able to leverage existing infrastructure uh, in, in a better way. And where you can see that right now is in uh, is in port congestion. I was talking about supply chain issues earlier. There's actually already been some money that's been spent in this infrastructure bill that was immediately earmarked for the ports. Um, it's a little bit of political uh, positioning because the reality is it's probably going to take longer than uh, than current supply chain issues are going to persist to uh, to get this up and running. But the idea here is that it's not always about adding another road. It's not always about digging a deeper port. How can we use technology to make existing assets more efficient? Some of that will be artificial intelligence. You know, can we uh, utilize greater capacity? Can we load and unload ships faster by using computers? Uh, going back to our original theme of robotics, but you know, can we use automation to our advantage here? Can we use AI in airports uh, to reduce delays, uh, not creating such a manual process for flight patterns and, and uh, rerouting around weather? Uh, can we use it in railroads as well? Uh, you know, very linear, basic systems. You know, do we need people managing things based off of experience and gut, or can we use artificial intelligence to constantly analyze the data and optimize uh, routing around the country uh, on these different types of infrastructure? So uh, we're already seeing dollars deployed uh, in this space to reduce some of the supply chain issues, uh, but I think infrastructure technology is going to be a very key growth area as well, as frankly, we reach physical constraints of not being able to make ports bigger or make roads wider we have to just be able to utilize them more effectively. So uh, with that, I'll move to the fourth and final theme that we'll talk about today. And then of course, we'll uh, we'll open it up for the questions at the end. So if anything is uh, striking a, a question in your head, feel free to submit that in the questions box. And I know Mark will uh, be picking some of the best questions that come in and we'll, we'll try to answer them, but uh, please, uh, please do send those in. I'll wrap it up with this last theme though, uh, disruptive materials. Um, 
in essence, we we hear about so many themes all the time. We've, we've talked about robotics, we've talked about infrastructure, we've talked about battery tech. We haven't spoken so much about semiconductors or 3D printing or drones today, but a lot of these themes are fascinating and disruptive and potential. And sometimes what people lose sight of is it's not just about the technology for technology's sake, and it's not that everything is digital and can be built in, you know, in the metaverse or in cyberspace. There's real physical materials that have to go into these technologies for them to exist. Electric vehicles can be as exciting as you want them to be, but if you can't get the materials that go into those batteries, we're not going to have electric vehicles. Uh, same with fuel cells, same with wind turbines and solar. They require very specific uh, in often cases, rare earths or, or, or certain types of metals and compounds uh, to be built. And, the, and so far, society has not aligned around sourcing and securing those materials in the same way that they may have around oil. You know, we have an incredible globally integrated supply chain around oil. It can be sourced around the world, processed around the world, distributed efficiently. We don't have that same infrastructure and systems in place for things like lithium yet or copper yet or cobalt. Meaning we believe we're likely going to see some really uh, uh, interesting choke points in the supply side of these materials at the same time as we see skyrocketing demand for these materials through the emergence of these disruptive technologies. Uh, to paint a clearer picture of this, um, the IEA puts out different scenarios for different ways of approaching uh, climate change. Uh, you know, the most aggressive being um, you know, the net zero 2050 scenario where we, we purely we've reduced carbon emissions from the entire world, but there's also the sustainable development scenario that might be a little more achievable or even today's stated policy scenario, which is basically based off of what people have already said their commitments to climate change will be. In any of those instances, you can see that the demand for disruptive materials is going to skyrocket. Um, in the most uh, conservative estimates, we'll need double these uh, the amount of these materials going forward. Uh, to combat climate change in the most aggressive scenario, we might need as much as six times the amount of these disruptive materials to build all the wind and solar and electric vehicles that will be needed to reach uh, uh, zero emissions. So clearly the shift to, cl uh, to combating climate change, it's not just about regulation, it's not just about dollars committed to climate change, there's real materials that are needed to be able to fuel this shift. And uh, we've done a lot of work to identify what those materials are because we think this creates a really compelling investment opportunity, as often these materials in the past have just been kind of considered basic materials, uh, ordinary materials that do not have a lot of growth potential behind them. But what we see is actually phenomenal growth potential behind some of these materials. You can see here, we're comparing electric vehicles to combustion engine cars. Uh, electric vehicles use about six times more disruptive materials than every internal combustion engine car. It's the lithium that goes into the battery, it's the copper that goes into the motors, the manganese, the cobalt that also goes into battery design as well as graphite. So these uh, these renewable energy technologies like electric vehicles just use so much more of these materials. Um, again, you can see the other IEA uh, sustainable development scenario and stated policy scenario. We need a lot more of these materials than we're currently producing, uh, as much as 42 times more lithium than we're currently producing in the world today, as much as 19 times as much nickel. You can go through the board and see how much more we'll need of these materials than we're currently producing. And frankly, it's gonna take some time to scale that up. Uh, it's a physical process. This is not the digital world where you can create something overnight. It requires finding these materials, mining it, processing it, and ultimately shipping that off to whoever's gonna use it in their, uh, in their disruptive technology. So as we look forward, it, maybe it's a little bit of a, of a oxymoron, but as we look forward to these extremely disruptive technologies, I think we also have to look backwards at some of these commodities that have been long forgotten and somewhat undervalued as we realize how important they are gonna to be to the, uh, to the economy going forward. I was just gonna say, Jay, I think, you know, it's amazing when I listen to your presentation, you get this sense that, you know, we're looking obviously at disruptive and emerging themes, but what I think is really amazing is that we still see that these basic concepts of supply and demand still exist. So you still have the idea that, you know, maybe we're reorienting to, a, you know, a more greener uh, decarbonized economy, but that requires us to look at a new set of economy, uh, a new set of commodities. You know, we need, we still are going to be traveling places. We're still going to need infrastructure, which means we need to look at where that new investment in infrastructure is going to be. So it's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, the way that you've reoriented these themes is to really look at what are those fundamental drivers. It's, it's fascinating. 
Well, and you'll you'll see, I mean, throughout this presentation, you know, we talked about yes. these four different themes. All of them exist in the physical world. Um, right. You know, the pandemic was very much focused on digitalization. I mean, we couldn't go outside. Factories had to shut down. Uh, you know, so we were all on Netflix and you can download, you know, infinite numbers of movies on Netflix. But as we return to normal, knock on wood, we right. can't forget how important the physical world is. Things still have to be built by something, whether it's a human or a robot. Uh, electric vehicles uh, still have to have components that go into them to power them going forward. And those cars still have to drive on infrastructure. And all the renewable energy we're going to produce still depend on other raw materials as well. So it's um, if there's kind of an overarching theme to 2022, it's back to the physical and you know what are the opportunities in the physical world that are kind of marrying technology with physical reality. Love it. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. I think what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, Jay, if you could just push us forward to those ETFs. Uh, we're coming at this from a Canadian perspective. So clearly Global X has a very robust ETF suite. Uh, I would highly recommend anyone who's interested in what Jay is talking about here to visit GlobalX.com. Uh, take a look at their website. It is an incredible resource for investment focused analysis of these themes. Um, which is something you don't get. You get a lot of obviously news talking about these themes, but looking at it from the investment perspective. Uh, but we do have some ETF offerings here in Canada that would capture some of these themes. Uh, the first one for the robotics for Canada would be our Horizons Robotics and Index Automation Index ETF, ARBOT. Uh, this ETF tracks uh, the selective, uh, sorry, the index, INDXX Global Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Thematic Index, which is the same. Uh, probably the most widely followed index in the world for this particular theme. Uh, what you'd be looking to get with exposure is really sort of the top 40 companies, 30, 40 companies that are in the robotics and artificial intelligence space, many of which are outside of Can out North America, in Japan and Asia, where there's been a, a much bigger investment dollar for dollar on uh, robotics and artificial intelligence to kind of reflect the need in those areas for manufacturing. Uh, it's a really interesting um, theme, and of course, I think Jay and I will talk a little bit about the inflationary aspect, but that ETF is 0 0.45 basis points and is listed on the TSX under RBOT. We mentioned going upstream, looking at those fundamental disruptive materials. Of course, the big one that we've been discussing is lithium, and at Horizons ETFs, we have the only lithium ETF available here in Canada, uh, which seeks to replicate the performance of the Selective Global Lithium Producers Index. Really from a simple perspective, this ETF is designed to really provide exposure to the equities that have the most amount of, uh, I would say, momentum from the growth of the price of lithium. So we're trying to capture as much the movement of the commodity, even though we're doing so through equities. And again, that's a global portfolio because a lot of those, uh, a lot of those lithium production is occurring in uh, South America, East Asia, uh, and so there's obviously some large American names in there as well. But again, a very global uh, commodity that uh, is seeing incredible demand. And this ETF would give you exposure to that. We don't want to spend too much time on the ETFs, but obviously people are here for the investment case. So, you know, we'll want to, you know, obviously let you know that there are some investment opportunities here. Uh, the Horizons North American Infrastructure Development Index ETF, which is BLDR, Builder. And as its name implies, this ETF is seeking to provide you exposure to the companies that are doing the building. That is the companies that are getting the direct dollars invested to really undertake this generational infrastructure opportunity that Jay uh, discussed. So there's a really big departure with this ETF versus traditional infrastructure where you're going to see a much lower exposure to energy uh, and telecommunications, utilities, and, and real estate and a bigger emphasis on construction companies, logistics, engineering, digital infrastructure companies that are kind of building our 21st century infrastructure, which is sort of 50 years overdue for a refresh. And then we've also launched with uh, Global X, a cybersecurity index ETF, following along on that sort of disruptive, uh, not disruptive, but that emerging infrastructure, the need for there to be more cybersecurity to protect our information superhighway and obviously data being sort of the new oil an incredibly valuable commodity. There has to be something out there to protect that. HBUG simply holds the uh, US listed ETF, which is BUG offered by Global X. And that's been a top tier performing ETF in the United States in the cybersecurity infrastructure 
uh, play. Um, and so that ETF is available under the ticker symbol HBUG, HBUG, listed on the TSX as well. I think that's it for our for our ETF push. We do have uh, quite a few uh, questions coming in. Um, you know, one of the questions they have for you, this is a really great one for you here, Jay, is how how active versus passive do you consider the themes that you come up with? How much oversight is in the development of these thematic ETFs that you're building, Jay, uh, in terms of what goes into them? Like, what go, I guess a, a better way of asking this question is what goes into a thematic ETF versus what goes into an index ETF, a traditional index ETF that sort of warrants looking at the theme? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and that you know, love to kind of uh, show people a little bit behind the scenes how that works. Um, you know, take a very simple ETF, the S and P 500. That index exists. You know, it's a it's a quite quantitative process, not 100 percent, but quite a quantitative process to select the 500 stocks in the U.S. And it kind of runs itself. Um, so you know, if you launch an ETF tracking that, it's uh, it's a very straightforward process with a lot of that IP you know already in existence. There's no S&P 500 of robots. Uh, there's no S&P 500 of, of lithium and battery technology. We're coming up with these themes from a very research-driven process to identify the powerful theme. And then we're starting with a blank canvas of how to design an index to target, to very accurately target uh, the leading companies in that theme, the ones that are going to enjoy the disproportionately the economic windfall from the maturation of these themes. So that whole process of identifying a theme creating an index around it, monitoring that index, uh, you know, it can be anywhere from six to nine months of, uh, of research and, and product development. And then frankly, it's an ongoing process beyond that because these themes are evolving. It's, uh, you know, it's sometimes changing a move, ch chasing a moving target. Uh, and it's uh, upon, you know, us as an ETF manager and, and the index provider to constantly have an understanding of how these themes are evolving and, and making sure, you know, if necessary, uh, that the index is is changing to reflect uh, the evolution of those themes. So, you know, on a scale of active to passive, um, you know, it's difficult to say, but it's certainly not just a buy and hold, you know, self-running index off the shelf passive. You know, these are portfolios that are going to evolve over time and and see new companies come in and see some turnover as these themes evolve. Uh, and so it's, it's going to resemble something a little more active. Um, However, at the same time, our approach to these themes is not to try to pick who's the winning lithium miner and who's the losing lithium uh, provider. You know, our index-based approach is still trying to own the entire space of lithium miners because we believe that's a space that's going to benefit from electric vehicles. So it's somewhere in the middle, Mark, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, and I think that you raise a key point when we talk about our thematic ETFs here in Canada. We really try to highlight the benefits of diversification. I think you know your group in in the United States and our group in Canada. We try to do our best job at trying to identify leaders in this space. But you could have you know a thesis uh, completely right and still get the wrong stock name. You know I'm thinking of owning Palm Pilot in 2000 or you know Yahoo over um, over Google and things like that, where you know fundamentally they're capturing the right theme, but you're owning the wrong stock. So that diversified index approach really allows you to own the winners. You'll own the losers too. But you have the ability to really capture both sides uh, and, the, and the broad sector movement, which ultimately, I think, wins the day. Um, we have a question on terms of uh, your thoughts on sort of Internet of Things and cloud computing and telemedicine. They weren't brought up, but uh, one of the listeners wants to know if you know any of those would fit into opportunities for 2022. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, the a lot of these themes are interconnected, right? Um, right. You know, we talk about infrastructure and, and the need for technology to make infrastructure better. What's the technology? Well, it's the Internet of Things being applied to infrastructure. Uh, you know, it's the idea that you can have smart stoplights, uh, you know, sensors on cars that are interacting with each other, smarter streetlights and cameras. All of these things are basically Internet uh, of Things devices that are integrated in, into infrastructure. So there's absolutely a case to be made for infrastructure benefiting um, the IoT theme. And then even further you know, downstream from that is that when all these devices are collecting information that's going to be powering this smart infrastructure, it's going to be stored in the cloud uh, and processed in the cloud and AI is going to be applied to it based off of these huge data sets that are being collected. So um, you can draw a line from investing in infrastructure to 
supporting the use of, in, of the Internet of Things in that infrastructure, and then a lot of that data being collected and stored in the cloud. So these right. themes are, are not happening in isolation. Um, you know, of course, you could look at other areas that are driving the IoT, you know, the rise of, of health and wellness and connected devices that are, you know, giving people more information at their fingertips about their health. Uh, you know, telemedicine, you know, the ability to access, uh, to, to increase the access of doctors and health services without leaving the comfort of your home, which is very closely related to the aging populations demographic trend that we talked about in robotics. Um, so all of these themes have, you know, in, in some, some level of uh, uh, relationship to each other, which is part of why we think thematic investing is, is so powerful. So um, it, the, the four themes that we picked today to discuss we all, you know, we believe are very powerful. That doesn't mean other areas like cloud and IoT and telemedicine couldn't be beneficiaries in 2022 as well. On the robotic side, um, it may seem a little counterintuitive to have robotics during an inflationary cycle because, as we've seen, a lot of technology is sold off as the discount rate discount rate gets repriced with some of these companies. But I think your view is that this is actually an inflation fighting sector at some point in time like do you actually what are your thoughts in terms of the idea that robotics could actually be one of the key things that gets us out of an inflationary environment well it's been well documented that technology can have deflationary pressures on the world it's taking costs out of the system so you know right now you have this you know that you have inflation and you know what's driving it could start with supply chain issues but so that's driving costs higher and then workers are demanding more money to be able to maintain their standard of living and that's increasing the cost of what's being produced and so producers end up raising their costs and the cycle repeats itself and repeats itself if you can put in a deflationary element into that process uh you can start to defeat inflation uh if instead of Raise, you know, hiring more people or raising wages 7% to keep up with inflation, you put in a robot uh, that will never ask for a raise, um, that will, uh, you know, be able to be financed at still incredibly low interest rates in this environment, um, you can start to defeat, defeat inflation. So I think a lot of companies are taking that very seriously, um, not just as a way of reducing costs, but frankly, because they don't have a choice. There's just not enough labor in a lot of places. They have to think about automation. Uh, in particular, uh, we're seeing a lot of advancements in the logistics and warehousing space, where it is that, that is, uh, you know, a labor-intensive space, uh, you know, facilitating, you know, e-commerce product uh, purchases, and they're just trying to eliminate as much of the human element as possible in that process to, you know, cut costs as low as they can, and frankly, to meet the staffing shortages that they already have. Another question just on the infrastructure uh, theme. I mean, a lot of the, the fervor over infrastructure last year was really focused on the, the bill from Biden. And for the most part, that seems sort of in limbo. What are your thoughts in terms of this theme, uh, even with the regulatory kind of benefits and drivers being in flux? Well, so the bill passed, right? You know, we have the the $1.2 trillion Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. It's signed into law and it's going to progress. Um, you know, there was other pieces that didn't pass, like the Build Back Better plan, which had, you know, additional money for climate infrastructure. So, you know, on one hand, you could say it failed. On the other hand, you could say it's delayed. Um, we don't know. But going back to, you know, this theme and, and how we were thinking about it two or three years ago when none of these bills had passed, the reality is there's a lot of different ways to fund infrastructure. It happens at the local level, it happens at the state level, it happens at the private level. We have record amounts of money in private infrastructure funds finding, trying to find projects of things that can be built and monetized in the, in the infrastructure space. So um, while the US government is you know, ultimately gonna be the biggest uh, check that can be written towards infrastructure, it's not the only source of those checks. Um, and infrastructure is so critical to our daily lives that the money's gonna get spent one way or another. Um, you know, you can't just have roads that are completely falling apart or water systems that can't deliver water or electrical grids that are not delivering energy. Right. They do have to be addressed at some point. So prior to the IIJA, we did see a lot more of that being funded at the state and local level. The difference here, you know, with, with this bill passing is it just, unlocks a ton of dollars at the federal level to accelerate a, a lot of these projects. But I, I wouldn't suggest that people think about it so narrowly as just being the US federal government. And, and of course, you know, overseas and in Canada and, um, exactly. and in emerging markets, 
it's a similar process. Uh, you, you can you have to look at the private space. You have to look at the, the local space as well as being sources of funding beyond just the federal government. Yeah, and we see that in Canada as well. Just for those on Canada, I think the estimate's about thirty to forty billion dollars a year in spending, uh, which you know is fairly significant given our relative size. So it, it is it is a bit, definitely a geographic theme that just goes beyond the United States. Um, last question, I think, is a perfect question for us to end, uh, and I think you give the best answer of this that anyone I've ever heard. Um, are thematic ETFs the same thing as sector ETFs? <laughs> Uh, well, you're setting me up. I have to get an have to get answer for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, the the short of it is that thematic ETFs are the new sector ETFs. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> is that what you're hoping to hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I knew it was coming. <laughs> um, you know, sector ETFs did a really nice job of slicing and dicing uh, the economy into you know different organized sectors. But there's several reasons why thematic ETFs are are in some ways displacing that. And and first of all, look at it at the company level. Um, it's not easy to put a company in in a certain sector anymore. You know, what is Amazon? Is it consumer? Is it basic? Uh, sorry, is it consumer staples? Because uh, you know you're buying a Tide laundry detergent at Amazon.com. Is it consumer discretionary because you're buying a bunch of stuff you don't need on Amazon.com? Is it even a information technology company because the most valuable part of Amazon is Amazon Web Services? It's and you can you know extrapolate that to tons and tons of different examples of companies that are really crisscrossing different sectors uh, in terms of what their focus is and, and what the value is that they're delivering to the economy. Now, um, thematic ETFs, you know, kind of throw out the sector concept and look at, you know, what is the tailwind that is driving this company going forward? Um, is it the emergence of a new technology? Is it a changing of consumer preference? Is it a changing relationship with the environment? So it's looking at slicing and dicing the, uh, uh, the market in different ways that frankly align more with the way that the economy is heading as we see technology being applied in so many different ways where we see disruption of sectors disappearing you know virtually overnight like the old telecommunications sector uh the emergence of of, of new areas and new technologies that are creating in, in entirely you know kind of un uh categorized areas of the markets as well so thematic investing is a more forward-looking approach anticipating the way that the economy will be tomorrow where sectors in a lot of ways are backwards looking at what are the companies that already exist that can that constitute different parts of today's economy. There we go. And I think, you know, that's a great way for us to end today's webinar as we hit the hour. Jay, just want to thank you again. You're always such just an incredible wealth of information on this topic. And I'm hoping we can do it again on the back half of 2022. Uh, there will be a replay of this webinar, so if you do want to revisit or uh, you were late to attendee, no worries. Something will be distributed to all attendees. And if we didn't get to your question, someone from Horizons ETFs will likely reach out to you, hopefully with an answer that uh, suffices for what you're looking for. But once again, everybody, good luck with your rest of your investment journey for 2022. And hopefully this uh, webinar puts some of these themes on your radar as exciting opportunities for long-term investment. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody.